Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Barometer Readings monthly conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Following the presentation, we will conduct a question and answer session, at which time instructions will be provided. For operator assistance during the call, please press star zero. I would now like to turn the meeting over to Sarah Potosky. Please go ahead, Ms. Potosky. Hi, everyone. Thank you for dialing in to the call today. My name is Sarah Potosky, Regional Vice President of Sales at Barometer, and I'd like to thank all of you for your continued support. On the last call, the leadership themes we highlighted continue to play out, and on our call today, David Burroughs will highlight these themes and provide you with an update on our models. Also joining us on the call today is Paul Campbell, co-manager of the Balance Pool and Balance Fund and head of research at Barometer. Paul will speak to some of our equity positions. Before I pass it over to Dave, I just wanted to highlight the performance year to date as our strategies are off to a good start. Our tactical ETF pool is up approximately 7.7% year to date, long short up 7.6% year to date, our balance fund up over 6% year to date, our equity fund up 6.7 year to date, and our in income fund up approximately 2% year to date. So I'd like to take this opportunity to pass it over to David Burroughs, and he will provide you with a market update and answer any questions at the end of the call that you may have. Great. Uh, thanks, Sarah. Uh, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, thought it would be a good time to, uh, to take a run through what's going on uh, and what we're doing in the portfolios. Um, as, as we've talked about for some time, you know, we continue to believe we are in the secular bull market for equities, uh, that slowly money is rotating from bonds, money is rotating from cash, and money is rotating from other parts of the world to U.S. stocks in particular, uh, but to develop consumer-led stock markets around the world in search of returns on their capital. Um, this, we think, still is relatively early days, and we look to our key uh, models and indicators for signs that that continues to be the case. So what I want to do is take a look through our lenses and talk a little bit about what we're seeing going on out there uh, and talk about what, what that may mean going forward. As far as breadth goes, I think most of you know that our view is um, that over time there is no bull market that ever had any legs where you didn't see, over time, an increasing number of stocks participating in the rally. Similarly, though, if you went back over 50 years, there is no bull market that had much legs where there was deterioration in breadth. Uh, if you take a look at the situation as it stands today, globally, 52% of stocks are in long-term positive price advances. That has been expanding since last fall. Uh, and it is a slow, steady advance. As of today, we will put in a new high chart point. So uh, the key point would be that breadth is expanding globally for equities, uh, but that we are a long way away from the 70 to 80 percent of stocks that tend to be in gear by the time a bull market comes to an end or, or starts to get long in the tooth. Uh, when we look geographically, the U.S. continues to be very resilient. 60% of the stocks in the U.S. market are in long-term positive price advances. That has been very steadily expanding since October. So despite you know, worries about ISIS and worries about Ukraine and worries about Greece uh, and you know, wobbles here and there globally over the first couple of months of the year, uh, I think that markets are in very good shape. Even the Canadian stock market, which did see deterioration in breadth from the summer of last year, until only about two weeks ago, where breadth reversed up, uh, is showing some, uh, some improvement. Of course, on a relative basis and currency adjusted, the TSX basically is trading at new lows versus the S&P, uh, but in local currency, even the Canadian market has been improving. If you take all of the major markets uh, globally, uh, there's additional bullish, uh, bullish signs. Uh, as of January, uh, of the 16 major markets that we look at, uh, seven uh, were negative, uh, showing deterioration. They were largely the developing countries, emerging markets, uh, and the, con the commodity-related uh, markets. Even those have shown improvement. There is now only four markets globally uh, in deterioration. 
the balance are all improving. So breadth is expanding not only stock to stock and sector to sector, but market to market. So there is money working its way into equities around the world. When we look at the U.S. market, a market that for the last two years largely was led by large cap, they have been joined over the last three months with both small cap and mid cap. U.S. small cap, S&P small cap index breaking out to new highs after trading sideways for a year and weak relative to the S&P really picking up over the last three months from a relative strength standpoint. And the Russell 2000 making one-year highs breaking out to the upside, and again, over the last two months, positive relative strength versus the S&P. That speaks to the fact that investors are looking for exposure to the U.S. domestic economy, which tends to be more uh, readily available through small and mid-cap stocks. Um, now, Europe has shown significant improvement, and some of the local markets like uh, Germany and France trading at new highs, U.K. trading at new highs, we have to look at currency uh, and the impact on our investors. Euro, as you know, has been weak, uh, is really showing no signs of change there. So we've been very cautious with Euro-denominated investments. But again, it is positive that breadth is expanding in Europe as well. It speaks to the fact that QE uh, in the U.S. worked well for equity prices. QE is having an impact on financial assets in Europe. QE is having a, an impact on financial assets in, uh, in Japan, where the Japanese market, both in currency, local currency terms and U.S. dollar terms, is breaking out, of, breaking out of a very significant consolidation. Regionally, Asia Pacific continues to be the weakest region in the world, although both India and Japan look extremely good. Uh, Japan potentially moving to secular bull market for the first time since 1991. <laughs> That's a long time. Um, does it make sense? Uh, U.S. earnings, you know, continue to grow. I know that guidance, uh, forward-looking guidance has come down, uh, but as we come out of the quarter, 73% of companies that have reported so far have beaten estimates. Roughly 57% of companies have beaten on the revenue line. Uh, there are some notable uh, strengths and there's some notable weaknesses. Obviously, guidance coming out of energy is weak. Material is generally weak. Um, telecom and utilities... Uh, have been uh, a little bit mushy, but when we look at the key sectors that we've been focused on, healthcare, uh, consumer discretionary technology, very strong. So um, we would say that we are in a market where there is some very clear leadership. Uh, we've seen um, uh, breadth improve in the themes that we're focused in, and that brings me to a second point. In a secular bull market, leadership tends to have longevity. If you go back to the 1990s, if you found your way to tech, healthcare, and the consumer, you got multiple expansion over several years, and as correlations fell sector to sector, by getting to the right sectors, it made a big difference. That continues to be the case in this market that we're in. Uh, really since uh, a year ago, consumer sectors have been performing well, and especially since the price of oil started to drop uh, uh, in earnest in the fall, uh, consumers have been particularly strong. If you take a look at the consumer ETF, if you look at travel and leisure, if you look at retail, retail really has led the market over the last four months. Uh, and so far, the early uh, reports out of, uh, out of retail have been strong, earnings up just a little over 8% uh, for the quarter. Um, one of the companies we'd highlight that we're invested in, in a couple of the mandates is Home Depot. We've, we've talked about this sort of ongoing as an example of what it is that we look for in our strategies. Uh, home Depot went into the recession really as the market share leader in home improvement. Um, they came out the other side having gone through some restructuring. Since 2010, their margins have gone from roughly 9% uh, to just about 14%. Uh, their same store sales have grown from just over 2%. Uh, most recent quarter was just around a 6% growth in same store sales. Uh, and uh, when we look at the numbers that came out last night, you know, just dynamite earnings, very strong on the earnings front. Um, the uh, announced a three-year, new three-year buyback program of $21 billion, just about 12% of their total market cap. Uh, they raised their dividend by 26%. 
Uh, this is a classic example of a company that was good but getting better. Uh, we are seeing both multiple expansion and earnings growth there, uh, and it's a, a great poster child for the type of business that we look for. We're looking for an investment in a sector that's seeing improving breadth in a market that is strong relative to its peers, uh, and uh, Home Depot has, has all of that. Um, as, as far as leadership goes, uh, we talk about consumer. Healthcare continues to lead and has for the last two years, whether you're looking at biotech, whether you're looking at pharma, whether you're looking at devices, whether you're looking at managed care, uh, we continue to see money get put to work there. We've been focused in, in these groups for some time. Uh, Actavis is one of the names that we're invested in. Here's another example. Uh, Actavis has had a history of making good acquisitions. Um, a year ago, uh, they made the purchase of Forest Labs, and then the process of, of trying to complete the purchase of Allergan of the five deals they've done in their history, every deal has been accretive. Every deal has uh, had more cost savings than was estimated at the beginning. Uh, and they wound up getting very, very strong uh, returns on each of their purchases. Every purchase that they've made has improved the quality of their product portfolio. Arguably, Allergan uh, provides a, a portfolio that is much stronger than what they have, which gives them runway for, for growth going forward. Um, and, uh, and they have committed to uh, using, you know, new free cash flow uh, to, uh, to return to shareholders. So uh, consumer, healthcare, defense is a sector that we've been, we've been adding to. Companies like Lockheed Martin, uh, you know, they have the F-35 program, which is the largest defense contract. Uh, the, uh, there's there's uh, additional contracts to come. They are the leader on the long-range uh, bomber program, um, and uh, we believe that um, that spending on defense is just about to start ticking higher after 10 years of decline. Technology continues to be leadership. Uh, we see strength in semiconductors. We see strength in security software. We see uh, strength in, um, in enterprise software. Companies appear to continue to be willing to invest in, uh, capital in uh, in uh, technology. So there's some very clear leadership uh, and we are focused in these areas. These are all sectors that tend to do well with a strong dollar. There's no sign the uh, U.S. dollar is ready to, uh, to weaken material versus, versus a euro or yen. Um, our focus tends across the portfolios to be most concentrated in the U.S. Uh, with, of course, some weightings in Canada because we are domiciled here and our clients are domiciled here and there are sectors that benefit from a, from a weaker Canadian dollar. So as, as it sits today, uh, you know, obviously our largest portfolio is the income portfolio. Uh, it has had the lowest return year to date. It is a very conservatively run portfolio. Um, I, I want to remind people that all of our strategies tend to have a very low correlation, which means that our returns don't match up exactly with market returns. They, don't, they tend to come in bunches. Uh, and the fact that uh, it's having a slower start for the year is not a concern to us. Uh, we think that we're positioned very well from a sector standpoint. Our big weightings in the income portfolio, biggest weight would be financials at 22% of the portfolio. Largely, those financial positions are in the U.S. Uh, Canadian financials are underperforming U.S. financials year to date. Uh, we have about a 15% weight in industrials, which is largely transports. Uh, consumer discretionary makes up 15% of the portfolio. If you were to look at the retail sector in the Canadian market, really it's about the best performing part of the market. Uh, energy comes in at about 12%, which is largely refining, and a, a single digit uh, exposure to energy infrastructure, which we continue to think has good long-term themes. Uh, consumer staples comes in at 9%, and technology comes in at 8%. Um, so, uh, income portfolio continues to see really good dividend increases, and we think we're likely to continue to see share buybacks and, and dividend increases through the year. On the equity side, the one major difference, as you know, is there is no income constraint. There's no expectation that we need to have securities that pay us dividends. There are several uh, sectors that are very interesting and several positions that are very interesting. So, our exposure in the equity side is, is more U.S. focused, 63% of the portfolios in the U.S. Uh, technology makes up 21% of the portfolio. 
healthcare makes up 19%, consumer discretionary 18%, staples 13%, uh, and financials 12%. So we are very concentrated in, in those sort of key themes. What the second point I want to make on, on all of our portfolios is I think many of you know that our focus is get to the themes and sectors that are working and stay there as long as they work. The first leg of this bull market was driven by, by rising energy production and the positive impact it had on infrastructure and on the producers and on the service companies. And that provided great return for three and a half to four years that we were focused in those areas. In the fall of last year, clearly there was rotation as production started to outstrip supply and the price of oil started to fall. Our breadth models went through uh, transition. We saw weakness in the energy space and over a period of a couple of months came out of all of our energy weight and moved on. Historically, when we go through one of those big transitions, we do have some, some uh, uh, indigestion in the portfolio as you go through it and you get repositioned on the other side for what's coming next and we get 18 to 24 months of runway in front of us. That's the situation that we think we're in today. So um, uh, income portfolios had a bit of a slow start coming out of the gates. We think is positioned really well. Equity portfolio transitioned probably a little bit quicker than the income portfolio. It's in, it's in good spots. Uh, sector weights, I think, uh, are focused in the key sectors and geographies that we think will do well going forward. I want to get Paul to talk a little bit about the balanced portfolio. As you know, uh, we are in the process of launching a prospectus balanced fund. I think we've spoken to many of you about it. I thought Paul could maybe give you a little bit of color on the strategy in that portfolio and some of the positions. Very good. Thanks, Dave. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, the balance fund, uh, the key constraint that we operate with uh, is that we have a minimum 25% weighting in fixed income. Apart from that, we have a very flexible mandate and we make uh, full use of that. Currently, we're positioned uh, with roughly 30% fixed income. That was a little bit higher, but we brought down some of the um, U.S. Treasury exposure and put that money to work in the equity market, uh, bringing the equity weighting up to uh, roughly 70%. So uh, the minimum weighting fixed income would be 25%, uh, so we're obviously quite bullish, um, along with Dave, uh, with uh, the fixed income just at 30%. Uh, the sectors that we're focused on are similar to the other mandates. However, we're doing it in many instances through different securities. Uh, the question we get frequently is what's the overlap in terms of security selection uh, between the balance fund and the other funds. Uh, currently, with the high income fund, the overlap's around 14, 15%, and the equity fund, it's around 4 or 5%. So it's really quite modest. As I mentioned, the sectors we're emphasizing, similar to the others uh, based on the DLA, uh, consumer products, we have very good weighting, uh, healthcare, technology. Uh, in the financials, uh, where we also have a good weighting, noteworthy, we don't have any Canadian banks. Uh, we have a U.S. bank, Wells Fargo. Uh, we have good weighting in insurance, Fairfax Financial, very well run property casualty insurance company. The insurance operations are doing very well, very profitable combined ratio, running at around 90%. Very successful long-term track record on the investment side. Recently uh, announced an acquisition of a British-based specialty insurer, uh, which looks very uh, additive in terms of diversifying the company's income stream, also uh, additive to their earnings power going forward. Uh, in the consumer area, we have uh, stocks such as Loblaws, uh, Newell Group we recently added, uh, U.S. Uh, consumer products company, a uh, variety of well-known uh, brands such as Newell, Rubbermaid, a big beneficiary of lower input costs on energy and materials, uh, the rebound in the U.S. consumer, uh, lower gas prices, all beneficiaries of those themes, home building uh, coming back as well. On the healthcare side, uh, company to highlight would be McKesson. Uh, it's the largest uh, distributor of uh, pharmaceutical products in the United States. It's on the right side of the healthcare equation where uh, the healthcare spend overall is growing, but there's also a, uh, a uh, push for increased efficiencies. 
Um, they've got a variety of interesting value-added businesses on the information and data, uh, data information side as well for healthcare. Uh, technology, we have also got a good weighting. We've got Apple, which I think everyone's quite familiar with. Despite how large it is, it still is extremely profitable and very reasonably valued. Uh, arguably, it's the strongest brand on earth, and they carry over $150 billion of cash, so it remains uh, attractive in our view. And we also have a company, uh, Fiserv. It's a financial technology company providing back office software services to banks that are under increasing pressure to uh, outsource a variety of services. So again, it's on the right side of all the pressure that financial services is under an interesting technology play. So net-net, uh, the portfolio is roughly balanced between Canada and the U.S. We'd expect that uh, possibly even to go a, bit, a little bit higher on the U.S. side as we are quite a bit more uh, bullish on the U.S. market and we're continuing to find uh, good attractive uh, opportunities there. With that, we'll wrap that Great. And back to Dave. So, so look, um, you know, sometimes you have to take the lens back a little bit and look at the situation our clients are all facing. Um, I got a book this week that came from uh, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, that, that I, I always like looking at. Uh, it shows extremely long-term charts and views on all kinds of different measures. And you think about where our investors are today. When you take a look at the Treasury bond yield in the U.S., it's been lower only once you know, since 1790, and that was in 1944, for a heartbeat. Uh, if you look across the globe, uh, in Japan, since 1870, there was never a time when rates on a 10-year bond were anywhere close to as low as they are today. If you take a look at the German, ben German benchmark 10-year bond yield since 1807, nowhere close to where it is today. When you look at yields in France, Despite the fact that they have a very long history, no time in history have they had uh, uh, bond yields where they are today. And probably the most interesting one I looked at was a chart of the 10-year government bond yield from, from uh, the Netherlands uh, that dates back to 1517, uh, where at that time bond yields were at 6%. Uh, again, today at about 1% below at any time in the last 500 years. So we look at that, and then we look at the portfolio of equities that we have put together today. The income portfolio last year generated uh, a cash flow of about 4%. Uh, it, the average holding gave us dividend growth of 20%. Uh, this year, we're likely to see dividend growth that is similar. We're seeing share buybacks. We're seeing cash, free cash flow yields in many of our positions you know, of between 8 and 12%. You look at Home Depot's return on equity last quarter at 48%. Like corporations are generating a lot of cash. And when we look at that opportunity relative to the multiple that you pay for government debt, and there is a mountain of money invested in government debt, if only a small piece of that slowly over time rotates to invest in the equity asset class, it means valuations go higher. Now we've had three years of rising multiples. And yes, relative to the last three years, the multiple is higher. But if you look at 100 years of multiples, we are trading at about an average multiple, just slightly above an average multiple. But at a time when the comparable investment of bond yield is at all-time lows. In 2000, we know that stocks were expensive. The S&P traded at 30 times earnings. The NASDAQ traded at 100 times earnings. These were companies that had no earnings. They were companies uh, that, that were startups. Uh, yet uh, they traded at the price that they trade at. Here we are 15 years later, the NASDAQ is just about back to that price point. Having said that, these are companies with real earnings, real earnings growth, strong balance sheets, uh, and, uh, and in, in most cases, uh, much more favorable dividend yields than what you can get in a, in a treasury bond. So we think we've seen the beginning of rotation from bonds to equities. We think it's only just beginning. We have really only just begun to see cash come off the sidelines. Cash continues to be both in corporate bank accounts and, and uh, demand deposits at all-time highs. We have only just started to see flows come back into the U.S. equity markets uh, from the emerging markets theme that was in place between 2000 and 2012. And we see only signs that breadth is improving 
from what is simply today a midfield position, nowhere near the end game. Um, so uh, we think that this year sets up quite well. We can get corrections at any time. We don't see any sign of that in our short or long-term indicators. Um, uh, and I think that with a targeted portfolio in a market where correlations are falling, we should be able to get more than our share of returns. So uh, I know that what Paul and Jim are doing in the balanced portfolio uh, follows our strategy, but the positions are quite different. Uh, what Sal's focus is in the long-short portfolio, again, similar themes, very different, expressed in different positions. What we're doing in the ETF portfolio across five asset classes, long and short, uh, very low correlation to any of our other pools. Uh, and the equity fund, I think, positioned quite well. I know everybody knows us for the, for the income portfolio. Um, but um, here we are, we're in the strongest point in the year. Uh, I think that we continue to be bullish, and uh, we'll look forward to updating you as, as things move along and as things change. So before we open the floor to any questions, I just want to take a moment to highlight our fund offerings. The newly launched Barometer Discipline Leadership Balance Fund offers a low to medium risk rating for clients looking for a 25% minimum of fixed income, which Paul mentioned, and exposure to yielding and non-yielding equities. The income fund, which most of you know, is a go-anywhere strategy, investing primarily in income-producing securities, and our equity fund, which is a total return equity strategy, taking advantage of equity revaluations globally. Please do not hesitate to contact Nick Hamilton, Kayla Peacock, or myself for any materials or with any questions you may have. And thank you for joining us on the call today.